Good morning and welcome in to the River's Edge Studios here in Millvale, Pennsylvania. I'm your host, Matt Geica, for this edition of Geik Scott Game, live from the Millvale Studios. In fact, Brian Crawford's on the board. Thank you to him for coming in and getting his morning coffee brewed up. We've got plenty on tap for you over the course of the next hour. Content packed program. It's my first show back in studio in a couple of weeks, so. That's always a thrill for me to be here. If you're unfamiliar, if you've never listened to this show before, I like to go deeper in the world of sports. I like to mix other topics in. I don't just hashtag stick to sports on Geek Scott Game, and that's an opportunity that I treasure every time I get it here. But coming up later in today's show, we have, uh, I'm excited about this special guest, uh, a friend of mine, a professor in the Duquesne University Communications Department. His name is Robert Healy III. He'll talk about his co-authorship of a new book on the so-called forgotten Pittsburgh championship team. And we'll get into more with Robert Healy in our second segment, second segment or second period, as we call them here on Geek Scott Game. The show is structured into three periods and an overtime, just like a hockey game, even though we're well out of hockey season right now near the end of July. Also, later on, why do all-star games have to be so serious? Why is that the trend in big-time pro sports these days? Also, we'll catch you up on the Penguins offseason. We haven't talked about that on this program, or I haven't talked about it on this program. I'm not going to uh, spread the blame around. It's my fault. I'm the guy who drives the, the bus, at least for this hour, every week. So we'll make up for that coming up on the show. Also, Well, forgotten champion, no, but a forgotten team in the Pittsburgh area, forgotten pro team. The Riverhounds have fallen off the radar with a very, very difficult summer already on their second coach, and it's looking like a lost year at Highmark Stadium. And I'll have your final number to wrap up the program. But first, something I wrote about as part of my duties as Pirates Beat Reporter at DKPittsburghSports.com, and you can check out my writing there on the site you can subscribe for as low as one dollar fifty cents a month if you get on board with our three-year plan even if you just go month to month though just test it out for four weeks and it's four bucks much cheaper than what you would be able to, to pick up a newspaper for or subscribe to a news outlets um get behind that paywall online we have one of those too but our prices are better and if you like pittsburgh sports That is all we serve up at DKPittsburghSports.com. But my Matt Stats feature, yes, I like the numbers and I enjoy digging into those, uh, which I do occasionally on this program. But this week's piece was on PNC Park attendance. And this is the sweet spot of the season for baseball, for the Pirates, for getting people down to PNC Park. And with the team coming off three consecutive winning seasons, I wanted to inspect and investigate where they stood in comparison to, at this point last year, when they set an all-time franchise record for attendance. And in case you're wondering, PNC Park seats about 36, 37,000, depending on standing room. They can squeeze up to 40K in there, and they've done it for all-star games, playoff games, opening day scenarios. But uh, last season for the Pirates, they attracted 28,568 for all 81 home dates. This year through 46 home dates it's a couple hundred below that or a few hundred below that to be specific and about 600 below the pace at this time last year which is just past the midway point of the home schedule so with the three consecutive winning seasons with the team breaking through this decade to make it to the postseason to be consistent contenders and no matter how you feel about this year's squad and its ultimate potential in October What they have done is put themselves in a spot two and a half games back as of this Friday morning of the final playoff position in the National League. So they are a contending team. Some may say in name only. I say they're a contending team because if you get in, as we've seen, anything can happen when you make it into the tournament. And that's what it is these days. It's more of a tournament type of a situation than it is uh, uh, what it used to be where only two or four teams would make it or even six going back. 
Uh, it went from two to four, well then to eight in the wild card era, and now with two wild cards, it's ten teams that make it, although the, uh, the bottom teams have to battle it out in the winner-take-all scenario that Pirates fans are very familiar with. But in theory, that should be good for attendance across baseball because more fan bases can convince themselves that their team has a shot, and the Pirates certainly do this year, but their attendance has been stagnant. It hasn't risen to that next level. To make a comparison that I have made multiple times, the Kansas City Royals coming off of tremendous success over the past two seasons. They made it all the way to Game 7 of the World Series unexpectedly in 2014. That group of young talent finally germinating, and then all the way, going all the way and defeating the Mets in five games in the World Series last October. So, Last season for the Royals was an all-timer in terms of attendance at Kauffman Stadium and Kansas City, a similar size market to Pittsburgh, albeit just a two-team market instead of three teams. But KC attracted over 33,000 last year, so that's well above where the Pirates are. That's above average in Major League Baseball. Last year it was 30,500 or whereabouts, which is the, uh, the seventh highest total of all time. Overall in baseball, attendance is down a little bit from its peak in uh, the previous decade, which was just shy of 33. But no matter how you slice it, the Royals are above and beyond. And when you go deep in the playoffs, uh, that appears to be a difference maker. That's get, that gets people excited. And that's what the Pirates haven't done yet in this current run of contention. They made it as far as Game 5 of the 2013 NLDS, the National League Division Series against the St. Louis Cardinals, losing their in the, uh, the winner-take-all game that closed out that series, and they haven't been able to get past the wild-card game the last two years. And if you are a Pirates fan, you don't need me to tell you that. I'm just filling uh, you in on the, uh, the narrative arc, as it were, for the Pittsburgh Baseball Club. And so there's the success, and typically, as teams continue to win, the attendance keeps rising. But we've hit some sort of a wall here, or a ceiling, maybe more appropriately, in the attendance figures that I believe will not be amended until this team does threaten to win a National League pennant or take the commissioner's trophy at the end of the season. And I spoke to Pirates team president Frank Coonley on this matter via email this week for my story. And he's essentially positive. That's the impression I got from him. Of course, I don't think a person in his position is going to be publicly negative about the fan base and the people that are trying to attract to PNC Park, but he seems to think with series coming up against the Phillies this weekend, always a popular one cross-state rivalry, also the Cubs and the Cardinals coming up later in the year, and just more warm weather games coming up on the schedule. The Pirates have more games in the second half of the season at PNC Park than they did last year. So all those factors add up to Frank Coonley telling me that he believes there is at least a 50-50 shot, not his words, but mine, that the Pirates will be able to surpass or at least threaten last year's per-game average in terms of, of butts in the seats. And really when I say that, it's tickets sold. So I shouldn't uh, lead you to believe that it's a turnstile count. That used to be the case in both the American and the National League. That changed over about 10 or 15 years ago for varying reasons. And, of course, no-shows are not a good thing, and I went into that in my piece uh, as well because you're missing out on making money in concessions, in merchandise, all the, uh, the ancillary things that come along with going to the ballpark instead of just or on top of just purchasing your ticket. So th the disconnect that I spoke of, though, comes from some fans that I heard from this week, and I reached out on social media on our website to see – if people are attending fewer Pirates games this year or if they're not particularly excited about this year's team and going out to PNC Park, well, what is that reason? And in this informal survey, it's not entirely scientific, in fact, barely scientific, but in this informal survey, 18 of 56 responders, that's 32%, indicated that the on-field product and or the front office's perceived commitment to winning has caused them to attend fewer Pirates home games this year. Other Concerns in there were a uh, dissatisfactory ballpark experience, some people upset with some of the fans around them, some ushers maybe tick them off at some point. So uh, you usually, when you, solicite, when you solicit responses in this type of a situation, uh, you're going to get the most passionate people. So there's going to be some outliers there. I don't get the sense that ballpark experience has degraded that much for, for most people, but it is something that came up. 
Other people said lifestyle changes have gotten in the way. That happens. I don't know if a team can really alleviate that or change that. And seven of those 56 people also said that watching on TV was simply more convenient. And that's something that all teams are going to have to battle. That's not a problem exclusive to the Pirates. I think we're in an era right now when it is arguably more fun to sit at home and watch the games with high definition, with replay, with the ability to get your own food and drink and not have to pay extra for it. And uh, most of us are more comfortable being homebodies because of technology. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'll let you decide on that. But that's a thing that that pro sports teams or any type of entertainment entity, I suppose, that's outside the house is going to have to battle, whether it's going out to the movies, seeing a show uh, down in the cultural district, if you are here in the Pittsburgh area, those types of things. You have to push a little bit more and you have to convince people that it's worth it to go out and not just buy something on demand or watch Netflix at home. Uh, But the one thing that I keep coming back to, though, is there is a certain segment of the Pirates fan base that looks at the Penguins and what they've done, looks at the Steelers and says, where are the Pirates coming up short? And this is a Major League Baseball thing, but there's no salary cap in baseball. We've talked about this before. And with the Pirates spending in the bottom third of Major League Baseball, getting up toward that middle third of, uh, of payroll spending, but with them lagging behind that median point, I think people believe that with the way the crowds have increased, used to be attendance was somewhere in the low 20,000s, now it's in the upper 20,000s, 27 or so, as I told you. But people believe, people want to believe, people want that payroll to continue to go up. And the way this offseason went, this past offseason, which is when most tickets are sold, season tickets and otherwise, uh, that turns some people off on the Pirates. And uh, there is a show-me mentality, not even related to on-the-field stuff, especially in the regular season. People have seen 98 wins in the regular season, as the Pirates accomplished last year. They've seen making the playoffs. They've seen going to the division series. They've seen making the wild card games, certainly. Short of a long postseason run, the, so there's a certain segment of this Pirates fan base that isn't going to be satisfied. That's the sense that I get with trying to win on a budget. And we can argue whether that's necessary for the Pirates, whether the ownership group can put more of its liquidity into the ball club without seeing any kind of return, a commensurate return in the revenue side of things. But that is what's holding some people back. And I, I go to... Uh, A different reference point from last decade, Uh, a similar type of a baseball market that was long downtrodden. The Pirates had 20 consecutive losing seasons. Well, the Detroit Tigers didn't quite have that many losing seasons in a row, but they did go 20 years without making the World Series, 22, in fact, between 1984 and 19, pardon me, 2006. And uh, in fact, that was the gap between postseason appearances for Detroit and their owner, Mike Illich, who previously was all about pouring money into his beloved Red Wings, suddenly wanted to win a championship in baseball. And so he started signing free agents, Juan Gonzalez, Yvonne Rodriguez, and uh, then brought in the manager, Jim Leland, started to really show an interest in reinvesting in the club. And the attendance at Comerica Park in Detroit rose to uh, a level that would indicate Tigers fever in Detroit. And making the World Series certainly did help. Again, that's such a... Um, a golden goose that's such a a touchstone moment for a franchise to go deep and threaten for a championship that's what we're all here for presumably is uh, to see if teams can do that how deep they can go when they are championship contenders when they are postseason contenders but once they saw that and once they realized that the owner was all in they have filled the park ever since and Detroit is a bigger market a bigger media market than Pittsburgh but um PNC Park is smaller than Comerica, and it wouldn't take much more. In fact, I mentioned the gap between the Pirates and the Royals, which I think is a more valid comparison in market size, is about 3K. And if the Pirates could boost it three more thousand, the the ticket revenue that would pour in could allow them to feel more free about throwing money around in the offseason. So um, I'd like to ban cliches on this show, but the chicken or the egg applies uh, in this situation for me. And... Uh, Until that bridge is gapped, whether it be from the team spending more uh, or the team on the field going deeper in the postseason, I think the Pirates have hit kind of an artificial ceiling, kind of a glass ceiling here 
um, when you look at the number of tickets sold and the number of people in the ballpark. When we come back, I'll ask our guest about this subject, but I want to talk to him more about the, show, uh, part, the, uh, the book that he's co-authored, Kings of the Bluff, about the forgotten 1955 Duquesne University NIT championship team and how Duquesne basketball has fallen off since then. His name is Robert Healy III, and he goes by Bluff Talk on Twitter. He'll be with me after this break on The River's Edge. Uh, it's Henry Boney. Okay. <laughs> no way. Henry Boney. You're, you're making up names. <laughs> no, I'm crazy. We're like, weren't Lewis and Clark, like, Clark sleeping with uh, Indian other? girls all no, the time? No, they were sleeping with each other, I'm sure. But, right. They had a dog named Seaman. Yeah, Win in Sparta. <laughs> Their dog's name was Seaman. <laughs> Darius Lewis. Can't wait to get you. Know, Seaman what's first 20 class. strapping young boys and a dog named Seaman. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Money Banks. Tune in to Funny Money at 7 a.m. Thursdays. Did you hear Tom? He said 7 a.m. Tune in. Second period time on Dyke Scott Game. That's part of our local music selection that we've got playing 24-7. Streaming at riversedgepgh.com. This is the River's Edge, and this is a new kind of radio, and I like to think this is a different new kind of sports talk. Uh, a team that doesn't get spoken of too much in uh, in Pittsburgh, especially these days during the summer, is Duquesne men's basketball. But we're about to change that on the program. The uh, the man on the line, on the guest line here in the Millvale studios, is a journalism professor at Duquesne University, Robert Healy the Third. We're going to call him Bob though because uh, he's been on this show before. We're familiar, and uh, I in fact spoke to his class uh, last. Uh, fall down there on the bluff so good to have him back and we're chatting about a book that he has teamed up with local author David Finoli on in fact uh, Bob handled the uh, the back end of the story kind of the uh, the decline of Duquesne basketball but the uh, the book is called Kings on the Bluff Kings of the Bluff sorry or Kings on the Bluff I keep messing this one up but uh, Bob is with me and he can correct me and, and set me straight thank you for joining us today Oh, Matt, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you're, yeah, you, you got it. On the Bluff. Kings on the Bluff. We are on the Bluff, at least metaphorically, right now. So uh, the book ostensibly is about both the rise and the fall of Duquesne basketball and the forgotten championship team, 1955 National Invitation Tournament uh, champions. And uh, back then, Bob, the NIT was it, was it not? It wasn't about the NCAAs. It was about... Uh, going to the uh, the NIT and winning there, and that's what the Dukes did. They had their glory years in the 50s, made the championship game in 54, and then in 55 collected the title. And uh, I guess you could argue since then they've been trying to reach those heights again. Yeah, precisely. Um, and, and that's actually exactly what uh, my specific chapter in, in Dave's book is about. Um, Dave approached me and said, you know, um, and Dave's written a myriad of books on, on – all sorts of Pittsburgh sports topics. He's, uh, I think he's most famous for his Steel City 500. I think he you know, ranked the 500 greatest athletes in uh, Western PA history and uh, across all the sports, got a lot of press. Um, he's written Pittsburgh Pirates Encyclopedia, among other books. And, and Dave wrote um, the majority of this book and, and did all sorts of research on the players and the coaches and uh, the administrators that all went into to earning this national title. But he approached me and said, you know, in the 40s and 50s, Duquesne, you could argue, um, was the best college basketball team in the country. And in fact, in 1955, as you mentioned, they reached that summit officially by winning the NIT. Uh, because unbeknownst to, I'd say, many of today's college basketball fans, especially the young ones, um, you know, whom Duquesne is trying to reach, um, or every, every team is trying to reach them, they're unfamiliar with the NIT as the senior tournament. They simply see it as the quote-unquote not important tournament, right? Not the <laughs> exactly. National Station tournament. But as you mentioned at the time, all the way up until probably the early 60s at the at the earliest, the um, the NIT was still considered to be the best tournament because the NCAA field was very small, and for a long time, if you were not part of a conference, you couldn't qualify for the NCAA tournament. So large independent powers like Duquesne were left out. Uh, and there were many schools who would, um, and, and only the conference champions would make it too. So, it's, you know, think about how that would affect some schools that like UConn, for example, that would 
win national titles or Syracuse these days, NCAA titles, they didn't even win their own conference. Those teams wouldn't even in the tournament. So the NIT was more open to independent teams, non-conference champions, but still the best teams. And so schools would often enter both tournaments. They would enter the NCAA and the NIT. There's actually, um, in this book, it talks about teams that won both, or in Duquesne's case, actually in the 40s went to the Final Four in both tournaments. Hmm. Uh, and there were times that teams like Duquesne would decline going to the NCAA tournament in order to compete in the NIT because, again, the NIT was seen as the better tournament. And uh, that was the case in 55 when Duquesne won it all. And Dave thought, you know, especially when after the Penguins had won the Stanley Cup and um, all this talk about us being the city of champions here in Pittsburgh, and we're all so proud of that, there's teams that get forgotten as major title winners. And, you know, I've always maintained that that ABA title in 1968 for the Pittsburgh Pipers should be considered one because that league eventually merged with the NBA. I understand the arguments against it. But I've also always maintained that 55 NIT championship team at Duquesne really deserves more acclaim in this city because to this date, it's the only time a Division One college basketball team has actually raised the national championship trophy, you know, on the court having won a tournament. You know, Pitt's national titles were mythical um, in the 20s, I believe, is when they were for basketball. So this one was really an actual tournament championship, and it was the best tournament in the country. Duquesne, here in Pittsburgh, won that tournament. Bob Healy is our guest on Geek Scott Game. He is, is it okay if I call you the co-author? I know Dave did uh, <laughs> so much of the yeah. uh, the reporting on there, but you have the, the fallback. You, you got the, like I mentioned, the sad part of the story. Uh, Dave yeah. Finoli writing about the Heights, and then you get to write about what's happened since. And to be clear, there were some conference championships for Duquesne in the 70s and uh, early 80s. But ever since then, it's been a blank sheet, and coaches have rolled through, athletic directors have rolled through on the bluff, and uh, there really hasn't been much of a, of a foothold, much of a consistent uh, run of success. So what's your explanation? If you could give it to us in just a couple of minutes, I know it's complicated, as most things sure. are uh, in this sure. case, but what would you pin it on? How has this program gone from where it was, what we were just talking about, to mm-hmm. where it is now? You know, it's, it's really fascinating. I, I, having been an alum of the school, a uh, student athlete of the school, um, and now working there, um, coming back to the field, I, I've done journalism and then some PR, um, and then now I get to come back and teach those things. And it's, you know, so I, I'm, I'm really invested in Duquesne from an emotional standpoint, having competed there um, as an athlete and then working there now. Um, so it's hard to look at this and say, boy, you know, I want to be fair. I want to say, <laughs> I want to hear the facts. This is why they're not winning, you know, and, and here are the theories why and here why, here are why people are not winning. I really delve into those. I'd much rather talk about, like you said, the other chapters where they're, they're winning. We all love the glory years. But unfortunately, as, as you well know, they're just too long ago. And um, they have to start winning again uh, in order to, to capture any kind of piece of the, of the Pittsburgh sports pie. Uh, so this book talks about, well, why not? I mean, why, why is a Division One school that often plays games at Install Energy Center with a, they have a court there, or excuse me, a locker room there, uh, they were as as late as 1981-82 that season. That I believe that's the season. But it was definitely the early 80s. As late as that time, Duquesne still had I want to say it was the eighth best winning percentage in Division One basketball history. Wow! And we're talking <laughs> that's the you get my age away here. I'm, I'm in my mid 30s. That's like the year before I was born. I mean, we're that's not that that long ago. So um, I do want to make that point clear, too. While it's been a long time since they've been to the tournament, this will be it's, – it's been 40 years. Um, in 1977, will mark, mark the 40th anniversary, um, you know, 2017, that is. That's a long time. But as late as 81, 82, again, still the eighth greatest winning percentage of all time. So what happened? How come since then they haven't been able to win? How come since 77 they haven't made the tournament? How come since um, 1955 they haven't been to – uh, a national semifinal of any kind. The, the, the last time they were at one was the 62 NIT. And, and at that point, the NCAA had started to reassert itself as, you know, the big tournament. But I basically walked the readers through these the theories. And, and I got these theories as to why Kane has not been able to get back, or even close to it. 
I got some of these theories on social media. You know, I'm, I'm as you <laughs> mentioned, on Twitter at Bluff Talk, and I'll often ask questions of people, friends, and, and followers. You know, why do you think this is? And, and people reply to me their answers. And I would go on Duquesne uh, message boards for that fans use. Um, you know, DukesSports.com, DuquesneFans.BoardHost.com. These really popular message boards for Duke fans. And so, what do you guys think? And I get a lot of responses as to popular theories why. So, throughout the aftermath chapter, as we call it, the aftermath, I get into uh, through research. Thank you, Google News Archives. Um, I get into research as to what are some some of these theories. And, and your boss over at DKPittsburghSports.com, he hits a real big one that surrounds Duquesne fans. A lot of Duquesne fans feel, and and Dejan is maybe not a Duquesne fan. I know he went to school there, but he's an observer, you know, very popular observer in town. Um, he would say it's leadership. The university administration just didn't care about winning basketball games. Uh, so I hash that out, you know, and I do it fairly. Um, and again, I'm an employee there. So when you read this book, note that, you know, I'm, I, I'm, you'll notice I'm not really pulling any punches. I'm simply, I, I have a lot of quotes in there from, from Dejan's article um, a couple of years ago when he says Duquesne rocks from the head down. It was not very flattering of current administration. <laughs> but I also, <laughs> you know, I also say, hey, you know, administration's changing. Um, Reverend Sean Hogan, who was the head of student life for decades, he is moving into a role at the university. So he at least you'd think would have a lesser role in, in the basketball program. Um, Dr. Doherty, the president, of course, is out, and, and, and Ken Gormley is in now. Um, we have a new athletic director and Dave Parker from the University of Dayton, in which they've been excellent in basketball for so long. So you could say there's some optimism. Um, you just have to be maybe a little bit patient. <laughs> and the <laughs> same fans have certainly gotten good at that. Well, Bob, one thing that uh, confused me from the outside, and I was living outside of town at the time, but I, I went to Duquesne for a year, 2004-05, and um, I remember at that time it was Danny Knee in charge of the program, then it was Ron Everhart. Uh, Ron Everhart had a little bit of success there going, but what was the uh, the justification behind uh, Duquesne moving on from him and going to Jim Ferry, who still has the job to this day, going into what is sixth, sixth season, I believe, or fifth season? Um, I'm trying to think of this, the math here. Um, well, that that is actually um, a big part of this chapter. That's one of the, the big theories about, um, you know, why they're not winning. Because as you mentioned, Ron Everhart was actually able to get them to win. Um, and his last year, um, I want to say it was. Oh, actually, here I'm looking at my own chapter now. <laughs> and Doherty, uh, it, it was yeah, President Doherty emailed members of the um, the board. Uh, reasons for terminating Everhart back in March of 2012. So his last season was 11-12. Everhart was the only coach since Mike Rice back in the 80s to uh, late 70s, early 80s to have put together a winning record on, on the bluff. So Ron Everhart, all those years, in 40 years basically, only one coach has put together a winning record, and that was Everhart. He went 99 and 89 from 06 07 to 11 12 before he got the X. And it's hard to swallow for a lot of Duquesne fans. To, well, why? Well, you know, what do we hope for? You know, you, you always wonder if you let somebody go, if you fire a coach because things aren't up to your standard. You always wonder, well, is there really greener pastures? Is, is, the, is there really someone else out there who can do a better job? And the feeling of Doherty at, um, at the time was that Jim Ferry would do a better job. Jim Ferry uh, had taken teams to the NCAA tournament. In fact, he, he did it back-to-back at Long Island University, Brooklyn, out of the NEC, but he still did it. Um, and Ron Everhart never got a team to the NCAA tournament. He was close. Um, his McNeese State team got to the tournament um, the year after he left for Northeastern. So hmm. you could say that was built a lot on what he had done there. But officially, he had never really gotten the team over the top. And, and President Doherty's... Um, reasons for terminating him were that he the, the program had stalled at a modest plateau with Everhart in charge and then three players transferred like all at once including Dan McConnell who's playing for the Philadelphia 76ers now that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back but I also dug into um you know was it really just all about wins and losses with with Ron Everhart or was it other things were there was the team close a couple of times to violating NCAA uh, standards, bylaws, if you will, on purpose and suffering major penalties? 
uh, was the team's academic progress rate dropping significantly too close to the minimum for Duquesne's liking thanks to the transfers um, and possibly you know, for other students just not graduating. So it's not just always about wins and losses. It's about some of the um, political things that happen behind the scenes in athletics department. And that's what uh, this chapter gets into. It's, I think it's the, officially the longest chapter in the book um, <laughs> because, again, it's been about 40 seasons since they've been at the NCAA tournament. There are lots of reasons why they're possibly not winning. It's really hard to say it's any one thing, the firing of Everhart or the firing of Jim Sadlin in the 80s or you know the installation of Eileen Livingston as athletic director at the time. Could it be Brian Kaleri? Could it be Greg Omodio? Could it be Charles Doherty? Could it be Sean Hogan? Could it be Jim Sadlin? You know, could it be Danny Nee? I mean, there's so many people in here that have had a hand in the team not winning for so long that the theories are a plenty. So I try to hash each one of those out in different subsections of the chapter. And the feedback we've gotten from the Duquesne fans is, is really, really strong. And it's nice to hear, especially about that chapter for me anyway. Well, so Bob Healy is the author of the final chapter of Kings on the Bluff, which is a, a book. When is it coming out? Is it out? Uh, what's the uh, status of the release there? Yeah, I, the final chapter. Dude, it sounds so on, ominous. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, so the book, the book is out on Amazon as well as Barnes & Noble. So Amazon.com, BarnesAndNoble.com. If you search Kings on the Bluff, we have it in paperback for seventeen ninety nine. And uh, it's also available on the uh, the Kindle for Amazon for uh, nine ninety nine. So Dave Finoli is the I guess primary author, but uh, Bob puts a bow on things as uh, as he does right now for our second segment on Guy Scott Game. Bob, great to have you on. We'll have to have you back. Uh, maybe we can fill in the blanks and, and look ahead to uh, the uh, the new Duke season once the uh, hoop season uh, approaches here coming up in just a few months, but. Uh, but yeah, so Jim Ferry, this will be his fifth season coming up. I was able to <laughs> establish yeah, okay. that. But uh, so we'll look forward to the fifth year of the Jim Ferry era down at the A.J. Palumbo Center. And uh, Bob, have a great Friday and rest of your weekend. Thanks for sharing some of your expertise. It was good to go a little bit uh, off the usual track here on the program. Oh, of course. Hey, really, thank you for, uh, for taking me, Matt. And we'll get you back on campus again soon, maybe get you in front of our class. That was great last time. Thank no, you. No <laughs> doubt. Really enjoyed it. Love uh, talking to uh, students and you know, maybe encourage them. I don't know if I, if I pulled that off, but uh, <laughs> good to look back yeah. for me. It was a nice little bit of nostalgia to, to, to be in the uh, communications building. But that's Bob Healy the third, and I'm Matt Geike. We'll return after this on Geike's Got Game. You didn't wash your hands, people who do not wash their hands should be fined. And I'm sorry, I don't know about all of you, but if you're gonna castrate me, you might as well just kill me! So enjoy your hot dog, you jackass! Get educated with Brian Crawford live Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. here on the River's Edge. Moving on to the third period of Geik Scott game. Hello, I'm Matt Geika, your host. Every Friday, 8 a.m., that's the new time. Used to be 7, now it's 8. A little more reasonable for me, at least. I can get in here if I want to do a live show like this one is. Uh, thank you if you're watching or listening live, but we appreciate it the same way if you catch us after the fact. Podcast page is at riversedgepgh.com. In our previous segment, Bob Healy, journalism professor at Duquesne University, spoke about his contributions to a new book about the forgotten Pittsburgh championship team, if you will, and and uh, Bob also mentioned another hoops squad that won it all that people don't talk about too much here in Pittsburgh anymore. That's the, the Pittsburgh Pipers of the old ABA. But the Duquesne men's basketball team winning the NIT, which at that time was the premier championship in all the land. That was 1955. And since then, they've been trying to reach those heights. And they haven't even made a national semifinal since 1962 in any tournament, let alone the NCAA, the big, bad March Madness. So there's that. Also, there's this. Join us for coffee and conversation July 29th at 10 a.m. at 21st Coffee in the Strip District. Katie Dudas of Scare House and Awesome Cast will join our Brian Crawford, who is behind the scenes today but in the room, for a live caffeinated show. That's 21st Coffee. And if I may glance at my calendar, the 29th is a Friday, so that's next Friday, 10 a.m. in the Strip. And also, you can become part of the local music scene in Pittsburgh by becoming our patron. 
Don't you want to become a patron? Doesn't that sound exciting? Through Patreon. Dot com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. But you can find the link. You don't have to spell it out, thank goodness, at the bottom of our homepage at riversedgepgh.com. Your voice for local music in Pittsburgh and some local talk on top of that, the River's Edge, riversedgepgh.com, a new kind of radio. I mentioned it's the third period. I tried to ban a cliche. I used to call it kill the cliche. I thought it was a little too violent. So we're going with ban the cliche. And uh, this one, I'm taking some creative liberties, which I do at times on this program. This is more of a narrative, more of a storyline than it is a literal cliche, although you will hear this in terms of the baseball all-star game. This time it counts. That was the statement in 03 when Major League Baseball decided to award home field advantage in the World Series to the league that won the all-star game. And if it sounded a little different back then, although it was exciting to try something new. I have to admit I did like the effort that was coming off of that awkward tie in Milwaukee in which both teams ran out of players because they wanted to get everyone in the game, and then there were no pitchers left. More specifically, it was about the pitching. The, the position players were fine. They could have gone on, but they played 11 innings at Miller Park, and there was nothing decided, so Bud Selig declared a draw, and no one liked that. So <laughs> that begat the This Time It Counts era, which is now in its 14th season, believe it or not. That's how long that MLB has awarded home field in, the, in its championship series to the team that wins a midseason exhibition. Why do All-Star games have to be so serious? That's the question that I have. And, and I was out there in San Diego last week, part of the reason why I couldn't record a show uh, busy times, although I did check in with Brian Crawford that Monday from the scene before the actual All-Star game and the home run derby. The derby, by the way, was good fun in person. But this whole event, this whole Midsummer Classic showcase is better when you're in the ballpark. I think it, the the fun the players are having translates. These guys love getting together with their peers. And when you make the All-Star game, it's an honor. Starling Marte was shaking, Clint Hurdle said, when the Pirates manager delivered the news to his left fielder, who deserved to make it last year, certainly, and, and did make it this season. Sometimes you have that season to set your name, and then the season after is when you get the recognition. And Marte was a gold glove winner last year, too. That helps on top of that. But he got the recognition, and he loved it. It was an honor. I don't think these players, even your David Ortiz's in their final season in Major League Baseball and in their final All-Star game, they don't get sick of it because – well, certainly when you're in a place like San Diego, that feels like a vacation anyway, as opposed to maybe Cincinnati the year previous. Uh, however, it is a, a time to catch up and be around baseball, be around the game while still connecting with some of your friends and acquaintances, making friends and acquaintances on other teams and uh, sharing some stories, maybe swapping some trade secrets and chilling out. For the first time in about three months, three and a half months, in fact, since spring training ended. So that, I think, is something that we should treasure. Sports are so serious these days in a lot of ways. And you hear Bryce Harper talk about making baseball fun again. And uh, I agree that especially baseball, one of our most staid sports, could use some injections of energy and enthusiasm on a more regular basis. And I think we are seeing that more. It's, it's going to be a gradual process, as that is more of an accepted part of baseball culture. But I think the All-Star game could be, par could be part of it, too. And, and it's a chance to take some chances and, and try to be innovative. I loved how the NHL decided, you know what, this All-Star game thing just isn't working. Let's scrap it. Let's make it a three-on-three -three tournament with all the divisions involved. And although it... Dragged at times. It wasn't perfect. It was sloppy hockey. But you know what? It was exciting hockey. And, and you had something new to look at without fundamentally changing the competitive balance of your championship series based upon it. It was just it was money at, at stake and pride at stake. And that should be enough. I know all star games aren't the most popular thing in the world. We can all watch whatever player we want, whether it through um, uh, our laptops or our devices or on TV with Every game covered, every game on television. I, I think that's the case now in baseball, too, even though there are 162 of them. It's not a novelty to see teams or players from the other league. Interleague play, of course, took away from that, too. The novelty is gone there. 
So let's go the other way. Instead of making it more serious, let's make it more fun. Let's try some different things. I'd love to see some sort of a skills competition in baseball like there is in hockey, like there is in basketball. And the Home Run Derby is kind of like that. You're showing off one particular skill, and boy, did John Carlos Stanton put that on display at Petco Park, making it look like a bandbox. But there's room to go more the other way. There's always going to be concern, I suppose, about injuries and, and things like that, but the hockey players do it. The basketball players do it. I think there's even some sort of a skills component to the Pro Bowl, which I have completely tuned out on, partially because it comes at the end of the season. Um, Part of the reason why I enjoy all-star games at the mid-season point is uh, because it gives you a little bit of a breather, and you're not concerned about the playoffs at that point. I think the Pro Bowl gets lost in the playoffs, even though it is on a bye week. So um, with the way that baseball does it, there still is an opportunity to get eyeballs on the game, to get people thinking about the personalities, the talents of these players. This is a great sport, and at times it's victim of its own conservatism in in the way that it's marketed and the way that it's shown off and the all-star game should be a time to just throw crap against the wall and see what what happens see if people respond to it if they don't we'll change it up the next year and uh, having the all-star game in places like san diego does encourage attendance uh, but i think you're always going to have at least that younger group of players i mentioned david ortiz but the younger guys want to exert their status they want to show off let them show off their throwing arms let them uh try to I guess, spray the ball over the field, make it like a hitting contest like they do in batting practice every day. Hit it to left, hit it to right, hit it to center. Show off a bit. And I think there are people out there more in tune with baseball than, than me who can uh, figure out a way to make it fresh and, and not have it affect the postseason. So uh, it, it's a trouble spot for me when you try to uh, inject seriousness in a spot when really the players aren't interested in being serious. Mark Melanson, maybe the most serious competitor on the Pirates. He was at the All-Star game. He told me he was just having fun. He was soaking it all in. It was his third appearance, especially uh, or especially in his third appearance. He felt that was uh, an appropriate way to look at it. He wasn't even sure he was called into the game. He was too busy chatting with his National League teammates. to notice Starling Marte even got into the game. He was just letting it all hang out and not overly concerned with uh, anything outside of pitching his best in the game. Outside of that, he was loving it and, um, and embracing the opportunity to uh, get away from the grind of 162. And that's what the All-Star Game in baseball should be about, in my opinion. We'll be back with overtime. I've got your final number and a couple other tidbits to catch up on the Pittsburgh sports scene. This is Geik Scott Game on the River's Edge. Hi, I'm Mike Storr, host of the Awesome Cast, which you can hear right here on River's Edge Radio. We're talking tech, getting geeky every week with people from Pittsburgh in the industry. Go check us out, awesomecast.net, or listen to us right here on River's Edge Radio, Thursday mornings, 8 a.m. after Funny Money. Let's go to overtime. Why not play an extra five minutes on Geek Scott Game? This is... Matt Geica with you, your Pirates beat reporter at DKPittsburghSports.com, also an all-around Pittsburgh sports analyst. I try to get to most things, maybe everything. We'll see uh, as my tenure continues over there on Dayan Kovacevic's site. We're approaching two years since he started the site. In fact, Lunatic Bash is sub- uh, Saturday. That's tomorrow. Wow, it snuck up on me. Um, at Highmark Stadium during the Riverhounds game before, during, and after. So if you are a subscriber and you're listening, you can pick up a standing room ticket for just $11 at the Highmark Stadium box office. Just walk right up, or you can buy a seat if you want, but you'll maybe maybe miss out on some uh, conversations that we'll have with you. We'd love to meet you if you are a subscriber. I like to call them members, in fact. Uh, we'll have to give them a members-only jacket, perhaps, to uh, signify their buy-in with the site, but you're the people who make it possible, make our site success possible. So if you are a subscriber slash member, then uh, there's an opportunity to uh, meet all of us on staff Saturday. And speaking of the Riverhounds, a forgotten team, we were talking about the forgotten champion, the 1955 Duquesne Dukes, but a forgotten team in the Pittsburgh area this summer as opposed to last year are the Riverhounds, who sit at 2, 11, and 3, 13th of 14 teams in the United Soccer League's Eastern Conference. 
They are winless in five, but at least they scored in their 2-1 loss to rival Harrisburg City Islanders last Sunday at Highmark Stadium on the south side. The Hounds previously hadn't scored at all in three matches under their new coach, Dave Brandt. And well, I spoke of a disconnect between Pirates fans and, and the team ownership in front office and the team on the field and how that relates to attendance. Um, there is a disconnect right now, I think, between the style that Dave Brandt wants to play, taking over from Mark Steffens a few weeks back, and some of the players that are there. And that's natural. When you take over midseason, you're not going to have all the pieces that you want or that you've recruited. And so the Hounds continue to grind away and seeking a foothold somewhere. They're more than halfway through the season, 14 matches to go, 16 down in the 30-match the season. And uh, they're well out of touch of the playoff zone, as they say in the sport of soccer. So they'll have another home match coming up. As I mentioned, winless in 5 0 4 and one and just a single victory under Dave Brandt, the former Navy Academy, Naval Academy coach, who had so much success there transitioning to the pro game. And uh, it's been uh, at times difficult to watch. And, and I would know I broadcast about half their home games whenever I get the opportunity on the team's YouTube channel with Gene Klein and Paul Child, a couple of ambassadors for the franchise. And it uh, has not been as exciting, I'll put it mildly, as it was last year when the team was leading the league in goals. Kevin Kerr, who is still on the team, and Rob Vincent, who has moved on to Major League Soccer's D.C. United. They teamed up countless times for goals, but more pointedly, the, the team was uh, more dynamic and uh, going for it on the offensive side. Yes, they gave up quite a bit late in games to squander points, but it was one of the more exciting soccer seasons in memory. And with that U.S. Open Cup match against D.C. United at Highmark Stadium, the facility was packed. People were excited about soccer in Pittsburgh. And, well, there is a, a good soccer fan base in Pittsburgh, but the fan base was excited about the team that plays in Pittsburgh, not the U.S. national team, not the nearby Columbus crew or any other squad they may support in Europe. So that felt different, but that momentum is no longer there from a psychological standpoint, and it's up to the team to recapture people's imaginations. They're in a deep hole right now. I also promised we'd catch up on the Penguins offseason, and Justin Schultz was re-signed. The free agent, I was expecting him to test his luck elsewhere, but he signed just a one-year deal with the Penguins uh, worth, I believe, three, $3 million. And uh, for a, a guy who's known primarily for his offensive game, he has some things to prove, I believe, to Penguins head coach Mike Sullivan, but the Penguins wanted to have him back, clearly, so he'll get an opportunity to do so. He was sheltered and protected in the Stanley Cup playoffs uh, to the point in which the Penguins would take a lead in the second half of games, and especially the third periods of games, and he wouldn't even see the ice. Chris Letang would take his shift usually uh, because the Pens were worried about defensive lapses. But when he did get on the ice, he was impressive in generating shots and generating attempts and creating scoring chances. On the power play, I loved his shoot-first mentality at the point. So the Pens will get all of that from the a right-handed D-man, formerly of the University of Wisconsin and the Edmonton Oilers. I think he feels like he's found hockey paradise in Pittsburgh, especially with the team as currently constructed, which is returning almost entirely intact to make a run at a second consecutive Stanley Cup championship. I say almost entirely because Ben Lovejoy, the veteran defenseman, signed a three-year contract with his old friend, General Manager Ray Shiro of the New Jersey Devils. So Lovejoy to the Devils, Bo Bennett traded to the Devils, so those two will be plying their trade in the Metro Division, but in a different market at the Prudential Center in Newark for half their games, and the Pens will see them quite a bit. The one thing that's still up in the air, Matt Cullen, the veteran centerman, and, well, he's versatile. He could play wing if you want to, but a bottom six player and was a uh, utility-type situation for him when he first joined the Penguins uh, last offseason, he found his role, though, played with some youngsters, gave them, I think, some confidence and competence, more importantly, to uh, give them a, a backdrop, a canvas with which to paint. He's still deciding whether he wants to come back to Pittsburgh. There's also a possibility he could return to his hometown, Minnesota Wild. He's been everywhere, man, to borrow a Johnny Cash lyric. And you know what? He could retire, too. He's getting up there close to 40 and I'm sure the thoughts of ramping it up for another NHL season, those get more difficult to address each and every summer. 
So we're waiting on Matt Cullen, and that appears to be it before the Pens report to camp. Lastly, appropriately, our final number, and that's four, as in the number of Pirates starting pitchers uh, that made at least 10 starts this season that had an ERA over five when they were in the rotation. John Neese has finally dropped below five to 4.89 after a couple of successful relief outings. He's been pushed to the bullpen. Francisco Liriano is at 4.96. Huzzah for him after his 13 strikeout, zero walk performance. What a virtuoso night that was for him and a comeback night for a guy who struggled this season. That was Thursday against the Brewers and the Pirates' victory there to take the series against Milwaukee. So Liriano, better results recently, but that looked like Liriano with uh, the swing and miss slider, the change up devastating at times against a, uh, well, I'll be honest, a a lackluster Brewers lineup, but it didn't matter the lineup before earlier this season. Uh, He couldn't find the plate and no walks might be just as encouraging, if not more so than the 13 strikeouts. So Liriano and Nice are below five. Jeff Locke is well above five at 5.54 after his latest blow up uh, this time at home, which was a rarity this season. He, I would imagine, is about to head to the bullpen himself like John Neese. That 5.54 ERA is second highest among Major League Baseball qualifying starters behind only Colorado's Chad Bettis at 5.55. And Chad Bettis pitches half of his his games in the best hitters park in baseball. And finally, Juan Nicasio, also in the bullpen. You're noticing a trend here. Uh, But he's at 5.08, despite some better results there as a reliever. So at some point this season, the Pirates were rolling out a regular starter who had an ERA over five in that role, and they're still just two and a half games back of the final playoff spot with se- under 70 games to play. In fact, 67 heading into this weekend series against the Phillies at PNC Park. Crazy good results, you could argue, for a team that has gotten replacement level and below from so much of its starting rotation for getting close to two-thirds of this 2016 season. It's been fun to be with you this week on Geek Scott Game. What a wonderful hour it was. It flew by. I'm Matt Geico, your host, reminding you that when the radio fades, you know life's moving fast. I'll be right back at you in studio next week for another edition of the program. Until then, have a great weekend.